Hare Krishna everyone. So in this Bhagavad Gita session, we're looking at chapter 5, verse 29. So, let's see, um, the verse goes, Bhuktaram Yakya Tapasam Sarvaloka Maheshwaram Suhidam Sarva Bhutanam Gyatva Mam Shantim Richati and um, that translation, English translation, goes, A person in full consciousness of me, knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities, the supreme lord of all planets and demigods, and the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities, attains peace from the pangs of material miseries. Right, so let's take a brief um, look at what this verse means before we go into more details. So, um, Krishna says here, a person in full consciousness of me, meaning a person who knows Krishna, not on the surface, but who knows everything about Krishna, his pastimes, his qualities, who knows that he's not just... Um, like some people think, a mere uh, mythological character or uh, maybe a saintly person, um, somebody who knows me in full consciousness, knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities. Um, which means that whenever we carry out austerities, sacrifices, um, it all goes to Krishna because he is the Supreme Lord and he is the enjoyer of all sacrifices and austerities. Um, the Supreme Lord of all planets and demigods. So, um, so we know that um, there's the spiritual world with his spiritual planets and then there's the... Um, material universe were the 14 planetary systems so Krishna is the lord of all of these planets he is the creator the maintainer of this world and the annihilator as well um, he is the lord of all the demigods so we have um, we'll look at demigods um, later on so he is the master of all demigods the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities which means that he has only um, he only wishes for all living entities to be happy he wishes them to be free from their suffering um, to come back to him where there is eternal happiness and he's always he's the benefactor he's not wanting bad for people for, for not only people but all living beings so a person who knows all of this attains peace from the pangs of material miseries so the supreme personality so what we understand is a supreme personality of Godhead Sri Krishna is greater than the greatest of the demigods so we know the, the leaders the leaders of the demigods Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma he is the, so Krishna says he's the proprietor of everything, the planets, he's the master of the demigods, even our body is his property. Therefore, one should offer everything, work, sacrifices, our wealth, all our possessions, in transcendental service to Krishna. Unless one understands these facts, it is not possible to achieve peace in the world either individually or collectively so um, so we know about the war in Ukraine um, we know that um, human beings like to fight over territories people say this is my land somebody else saying no this is my land if people knew that this is not our land or anyone's land nothing is ours it all belongs to Krishna if people know this, they're not going to fight over over things, over land, over countries, over wealth, 
there will be no dissension because everyone will know, okay, nothing belongs to me, it's all Krishna's. Um, so individually, collectively, individually, individually means um, our mindset. So we would be not um, quarreling, quarreling over wealth. Um, so we'll be at peace. We know that nothing belongs to us. Um, and the Lord is the benefactor of all wishes, of all living entities. He's not partial towards anyone. He's our eternal well-wisher. We suffer. Why do we suffer? Because we choose to enjoy our senses and incur sinful reactions from our activities. We'll look at that in more detail, but that's just a brief explanation. So let's take a look at Krishna. He says he is the lord of the demigods. Obviously a lot of people, because of lack of understanding, um, may criticize this. People may say there's many gods, there's many Bhagavan, um, why such discrimination, why we're we saying that Krishna is the supreme lord and, and we're looking down on others. We're not looking down. It's just we're accepting Bhagavad Gita from Krishna. And if Krishna says that he is the lord and master of all demigods, then we accept that. Um, so there's the term demigods, which some people might not really understand. I've heard people say, why use the term demigods, not a nice term. Well, it's nothing to do with nice or not nice or nothing to do with subordination. What it is simply is that there is one god. There cannot be more than one God. It's like in a country, there is one king to rule. In the same way, there's one ruler and there's Krishna, the supreme personality of Godhead. And all um, scriptures show that. So there is one God and there are lots of demigods. It's like a king, he delegates different departments to his ministers and... Um, and these ministers then take care. So we have Minister of Defence, we have um, Health Department, Education. In the same way, um, the Supreme Lord doesn't himself have to do everything because he is supreme. Like the King, he delegates different departments to the demigods because there can be only one God. And the demigods, there's so many of them because there's so much to take care of. Um, there's so many different aspects of material creation for them to take care of. So there's so many of them. 330 million demigods are, are appointed by Krishna. And they're given different powers to take care of different aspects. So we know um, Lord Shiva, he takes care of annihilating the, um, um, the world and the universe at the time of destruction <coughs> when all, um, Lord Ganesh he is said to be the remover of obstacles Durga Devi known as Mahamaya she is appointed as the prison guard of this material world the material universe the 14 planetary systems she is in charge she's Mahamaya the illusory energy of the Lord um, she has so many weapons and tridents to, ke to keep living entities in this material prison and to prevent them from escape. So all these demigods, they are very respectable. We should offer all respect to them because they are great devotees of the Lord. They are empowered by the Lord to take care of things. They are devotees of Krishna and um, so when we worship Krishna, we are actually in, um, we're worship, we're serving them. We are satisfying all of these demigods because we could not possibly um, make each and every demigod happy. There's so many of them. So all we need to do is water the roots of the plant for the entire plant to be nourished. So, because these um, demigods, they are servants of the Lord, um, devotees of the Lord, they are automatically very satisfied if we worship the Lord. Um, it's a bit like 
say our grandparents come to visit us someday um, our parents obviously it's their parents so um, and we serve our grandparents right maybe we'll bring them a glass of water we take them out show them around um, maybe do the laundry so if we if we show respect to our grandparents then our, our parents are happy with us our parents are not thinking <coughs> Oh, why are the ch are my children showing respect to my grand to my parents? Why are they showing respect to their grandparents? They should show me respect. They should do all of this for me, not for them. So they they never think like they're automatically happy if we show respect to our grandparents. In the same way, Krishna, um, all the demigods, they are happy if we show, um, if we worship Krishna. They're not vexed. <clears throat> Sometimes we, we see um, in Krishna Leela that some demigods get all puffed up. Uh, Indra Dev um, got all puffed up. Um, or Brahma. But Krishna um, reminds them very gently how, reminds them of their position. Um, sometimes we, we, all get, we all get puffed up at some point. Even the demigods are prone to that. So even though Brahma, he's the authority, he's the topmost authority um, in the, in his Brahma Samhita, which is very, very well known, praise of Lord Brahma. <coughs> Excuse me. Praise of Lord Brahma um, to the Supreme Lord Krishna. His very first verse, number one, goes, Ishwara Parama Krishna Satchidananda Vikraha Anadira de Govinda Sarvakarana Karanam. So even though Brahma is saying Krishna, who is known as Govinda, is the supreme Godhead. He has an eternal, blissful, spiritual body. He is Sarvakaran Karanam. He is the origin of all. He has no other origin and he is the prime cause of all causes. So here Lord Brahma himself is saying that the Supreme Lord is Krishna because the Supreme Lord, he has no origin. Nobody created him. Um, he was there in the beginning when um, there was no living entity in this material world. Um, he's the cause of all causes. Demigods can only fulfill people's material desires which are temporary and for sense gratification. Demons can worship demigods even and easily please them to acquire boons. So what we're saying here is that we can worship demigods, we can have faith, right? Um, in the particular demigod and offer worship um, but we need to understand that these demigods they die they are not immortal remember the um, demigods reside in the material universe um, the heavenly low planets so demigods will also get destroyed they will also have to die because remember in another verse, Krishna says um, that from the highest planet to the lowest, all places of misery where it rain, repeated birth and death take place. But one who, at who attains to my eternal abode um, and never has to take birth again. Some Something like that. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that there's death. From the topmost planet Brahma Loka down to the lowest in this material universe, there is death. So these demigods, obviously, they can award us material things. So let's say we worship demigods for um, I don't know, worship Goddess Saraswati for um knowledge, for work um getting good grades, or um, we worship Durga Devi or Lord Shiva for some for wealth or maybe for good health, or whatever it is. If it's material desire, the demigods can fulfill it. But if we want liberation from this material universe, they cannot award that. Only like, um, the Supreme Lord can do that. Um, 
so they cannot liberate anyone from the circle of birth and death. And demigod worshippers, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, will go to the planet of the demigods. So in the higher planetary system, there is a lot of um, opportunities to enjoy. There's a thousand times more um, <coughs> opportunities to enjoy. However, at some point the living entity has to fall back um, to has to take birth again and fall back to this planet of misery which is earth because um, these planetary systems as we said they're not eternal and when a living entity has exhausted the pious activities they fall down from these higher planetary systems so um, and, and also something to bear in mind is that demigods can only award benedictions with the sanction of the Supreme Lord Krishna. So they're empowered, they get their powers from Krishna and only with the permission of Krishna can they award um, benedictions. Um, so having said all of that, it is it is better to approach the Supreme Lord rather than the demigods. Um, devotees as it is are not interested in temporary material benefits they derive happiness from carrying out loving devotional service unto the Lord and go back to the eternal. So devotees are not really interested in sense gratification, any benedictions which are to do with the bodily, on the bodily level, um, nothing material. Devotees only want to worship the Supreme Lord. Devotees want Pakti. Um, Yes, so we have to remember that if we, the advantage of approaching um, the Lord for material benefits, even if we have them, is that the Lord will award us these material benefits, but at the same time, he will do it in such a way that we get purified from our material desires and we develop a taste for bhakti so it's better to approach the supreme lord um, here we have a story of Kali Mata and how she saved the Brahmin devotee of the lord from her, fo her own devotees her own followers so what happened is <coughs> there was a great personality called um <coughs> Um, so Bharat Maharaj, he was called Jad Bharat in one birth. Um, in that birth, he appeared to be very dull um, because he didn't want to do anything, have anything to do with the material um, environment he was in. He pretended to be dull, deaf, blind. So it so happened that some worshippers of Goddess Kali, they wanted some powers, some material benefits, so they wanted to satisfy Goddess Kali by offering some um, blood, or offering a, a dull human in sacrifice to her, to please her. So the um, worshippers went out looking for um, for um, a, a human, um, a human who they could sacrifice. And so they um, they saw Jad Bharat once in the field. He seemed to be the perfect sort of animal human, as they say, animal human to sacrifice to Goddess Kali. So they brought him, and the head priest did all the um, rituals. So Goddess Kali was there. We can see the deity of Goddess Kali up here. That's the deity of Goddess Kali. We can see Jad Bharat sitting there. They put him there, they were ready to cut off his head with a sword. But as soon um, as, as the, the priest raised his sword, there was a big cracking sound that came from the deity. The deity of Goddess Kali cracked into two, as we can see high up here. And Goddess Kali burst out of there. She was really angry, she was fuming. And she, with her weapons killed all her followers 
because obviously she was very angry that they were causing or attempting to cause harm to a pure devotee of the Lord. So, so yeah, that was just one story there. And here in this picture, we see Lord Brahma asking for forgiveness. Um, we know the pastime of Lord Brahma where he, um, he actually, the pastime of Krishna, I mean, where Lord Brahma stole all the calves and the cowherd boys because he wanted to test Krishna. Here we see Lord Brahma asking for forgiveness and Lord Krishna telling him not to get puffed up and to always remember him and worship him and understand that he is he's not the supreme lord that Krishna is the supreme lord right so we'll move on now to the next slide which is addressing um, this bit of the verse where Krishna is the benefactor he's the well-wisher of everyone Krishna is our only eternal true friend who wants only good for us so we may have friends, right? Um, but we need to understand in this material world, in this society, friends, they may not be true friends. They may be friends so long as we make them happy, we gratify their senses, um, so long as they have something to gain. Um, and then when, when all of this stops or we become poor or we, we, we're no longer able to make people happy then they just um, cut off all ties with us and, and they're like I'm not your friend anymore so Krishna is not like that Krishna has been with us accompanying us throughout our numerous our innumerable life um, birth and death so Krishna has been with us he didn't leave us abandon us we're here in this material world We've been taking so many births and dying and getting, being born again. And Krishna has accompanied us as our eternal friend. Krishna sits in our heart as the Paramatma and he witnesses all our activities. Um, he actually, he only wants good for us. He wants us to stop suffering and come back to him in the spiritual world. That's what he wants and isn't it the reason why he spoke the Bhagavad Gita for us, for our good? And even then we forgot there were so many uh, wrong interpretations over time, the knowledge got lost. But Krishna, he came actually recently, 500 years ago, he came out of his concern, out of his compassion for all living entities who have forgotten him. He came to show us to demonstrate, he came in the form of a devotee even, to demonstrate to us what he meant by surrender in the Bhagavad Gita, what he meant um, when he talked about Bhakti Yoga and how to surrender to him and how to worship him. He even came down to this very filthy planet um, in the form of Lord Chaitanya, in the form of a devotee to teach us how to do it even. So Krishna cares for us, he cares deeply and he doesn't want us to suffer. Krishna is all good and kind. So people may say, well if you're God, he's all good, then what's wrong? Why is he making everyone suffer? Why does God allow bad things to happen? <clears throat> this is a common question <coughs> from people who um, who don't understand things. So the reason why bad things are happening is not because of God. It's, it's, it's us. We get bodies where we suffer according to our activities in our previous life, activities in this present life. So according to our desires as well. And so um, we incur sinful reactions from our own activities. And therefore we suffer happiness and distress according to the results of our actions. So if we do something bad, sinful, okay, we're, say we're going out, we're stepping on living entities, we can't control it. Um, we're breathing in air, we're breathing in a lot of living entities, we're killing them. We are consciously eating meat or um, we're causing distress to other living entities 
Um, so all of this, we may not suffer straight away, right? But the laws of material nature are such that if we commit sinful reactions, we will have to suffer. There is no escape. It's a bit like in, um, um, we know in, in the world, we have um, the police department, the defense um, department is there to make sure there is law and order in society, right? So if someone kills somebody else or robs them, or um, does some abominable act which is against the law, that person will have to be tried in a court, that person will have to pay a fine, or they will be put behind bars because there is law, right? In the same way, material nature has, has stringent laws and um, we may think, oh, we've got away with it, but no, um, we can't escape. So that's all our doing. And we can minimize sinful reactions by chanting the holy name. So we, we one may think, well, I've committed so many sinful reactions in my past life. What can I do now? It's there and I'm, I'm going to have to suffer. What can I do? Am I doomed? Well, th the truth is you can stop from now on doing sinful reactions, committing um you know, giving distress to others, eating meat, but um, you can stop all of that and you can chant the holy name because the holy name of the Lord is so potent, it burns to ashes all the sinful reactions we may have committed so far. So we just simply by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Krishna has given us this simple mantra to chant to burn the sinful reactions. <coughs> so um, coming back, um, so why do we suffer? So Krishna, he knows it's bad. As a witness, he's witnessing our activities. He knows it's bad. But he cannot tell us, no, don't do it. He gives us independence to act because he loves us. And love means not forcing anyone to surrender, not forcing anyone to love him. He gives us independence to act. And we suffer if we forget our relationship with him. And if we choose to enjoy material nature, which only gives us distress, and we try to forget him, we enjoy in this material world, we're bound to suffer. So we're all trying to um, enjoy our senses, we think we're enjoying. Actually, material, the nature of material enjoyment is that initially it's like nectar, but then it becomes poison. Um, so let's take an example. Let's say somebody loves eating ice cream, right? So that person buys their first ice cream and they relish it. Oh, so, so enjoyable, so yummy. And then, so that's his temporary, right? And the ice cream's gone and the person wants more happiness. So wants more ice cream, goes to the ice cream van, buys a second ice cream. Okay, it's nice, but not as good as first ice cream they ate. So they eat it. What happens if a person goes on and on and on, hundred times? What is the person going to be like after eating hundred ice creams? In an agony of pain, stomach aches, all kinds of bodily problems. Um, so it's, it's nectar in the beginning, but in the end it's poison. Um, probably have to be taken to the hospital. Um, yeah, so this is just a simple example how we try to enjoy material things, we need to understand that in the end they will cause us distress. And also our ability to enjoy is very limited. I mean, like how many ice creams can you eat? Um, we have a small stomach and we can only, a digestion can only, um, you know, it poses some restrictions there as to how much food we can enjoy. But with um, Krishna, 
with spirituality, with、um, Krishna consciousness, the happiness we feel is everlasting. It's very satisfying, and it's ever, it's ever increasing joy we we get when we serve Krishna, we chant the holy name. It's, it's nothing like the mundane happiness. Um, so here we have a story of Brigu Rishi who wanted to test the Trinity to establish the supremacy of the Lord of Vaikuntha. So we know the Trinity: Lord Brahma, Lord Vishnu,、um, Lord Shiva. So uh, uh,、um, uh, a few sages, an assembly of sages, <coughs> was there, and、um, people were discussing. Who is the greatest? So one Rishi decided to do a test and report to all the sages. So he went to Brahma Log, and he、um, no Brahma saw him coming, and、um, he was happy and he, you know, but he noticed that the sage、um, he did not show any respect, didn't pay obeisances to him. Um, disrespectful, so Brahma. He was not very pleased, but he didn't say anything. So Brigamuni then went to Lord Mahesh、um, and Kailash, and、um, Mahesh saw the Rishi coming. And obviously, he was very happy, but、um, the Rishi then、um, he started saying、um, words which were disrespectful to Lord Shiva, and Lord Shiva. Got so angry, he was going to kill the the rishi. But Goddess Parvati stopped him and said, "No, you should not kill a Brahmin.、Um, it's it's very sinful." So the the rishi didn't say a word, and he just left. And he went to Vaikuntalog. He um he saw the Lord lying on、um, a bed of snakes, an antashesh, and the Goddess Lakshmi was massaging. His feet.、Um, he so Brigamuni did something very bold. He jumped and he, as you can see in the picture, he struck the Lord on the chest, which is a very offensing offensive act. But what was the reaction of the Lord of Ekunta? He opened his eyes and he saw that Brigamuni was there. Um, he quickly got up from his seat with Goddess Lakshmi, and he paid obeisances to the sage. And he said, "Oh, my dear sir,、um, I hope you, your soft lotus feet, lotus foot, did not get hurt from striking my very hard chest."、Um, I'm sorry. I, I, I sh-、uh, I'm sorry. I did not notice that you had come. And so the Lord welcomed the sage and satisfied him with pleasing words. And so, and so the sage obviously he was very impressed because the Lord, who is the so the Lord of the universe is, he is very compassionate and humble and full of goodness. So Brigamuni then he. He、um, so the Lord is not affected by the modes of material nature, obviously.、Um, so Brigamuni then went to the assembly of the sages、um, to report to them his findings. Right. So we said that this material world is full of material miseries, and how do we get relief from the pangs of material miseries? Is what the verse is about, right? So Krishna says, if we know that He's the Lord, the Master of all the planets and demigods, He's the benefactor of all living entities. He is the um, um, well-wishing friend. We saw the verse here.、Um, so these people can attain peace from the pangs of material miseries. So what misery? So we know in this material world, there's three kinds of miseries that we are constantly attacked by: adi atmika, adi bhotika, and adi devika. So the material world, we said, is a prison house where there cannot be true happiness. We're constantly attacked 
So adiatmika, those miseries which arise from the mind and the body, adibhotika, those miseries inflicted by other living entities, and adidavika, those miseries arising from natural calamities over which we have no control. So devotees, how can devotees attain peace from the pangs of material miseries is by rendering devotional service to Krishna. So let's have a look here how a devotee attains peace from the material miseries. Um, why a devotee attains peace is because a devotee offers everything in transcendental service to Krishna, including their mind, the body, the senses, the intelligence and world. So a devotee knows that everything belongs to Krishna and so they offer everything back to Krishna because they know he's the proprietor. So um, so for instance, if a devotee has a, a, a nice house, the devotee thinks, let me invite um, everyone to my house, feed them prasadam, uh, have some Krishna Kata, have some kirtan. Um, yeah, or if a devotee has a car, he's thinking, how can I use the car in Krishna service? Yes, I'll carry devotees in my car. Um, I'll use it to go, um, say to the shop, buy some vegetables for Krishna, some boga, some flowers for him. I'll use it to go to attend the um, um, Kirtan Mellas or I'll um, use my car to, um, I don't know what else, to, to go to work so then I can give donations to the temple. So in this way a devotee offers everything to Krishna. In this material world, obviously, we have, we're surrounded by Krishna's material energy, but we should not reject them. We can use them, but just use them in Krishna's service. We get purified then. So we know a devotee should be, so devotees in the world, right, but we should not be of this world. Um, so we should not be engrossed in material things we we'll just let it flow not engross material things not attached to happiness distress honor dishonor it will all come and go like the summer and winter seasons so we should just be unaffected by it and just focus on our devotional service just like these drops droplets of water will just flow off the leaf of the water lily so we should be like bali maharaj as we can see, the, 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 the Bali Maharaj surrendered everything to the Lord, Lord Vamanadev. We should be like that. Number two, a devotee carries out their duty, offers all their work to Krishna, and is detached from the results of their work. Hence, a devotee is free from anxieties. So we all carry out work, we do our duties. Um, we should be like practicing karma yoga where we're not attached to the results of our work. Instead, we offer them to Krishna. So, um, so if we earn some money, we should not we use it in Krishna consciousness. We're not um, over endeavoring for it. Because we can see this picture illustrates what happens all our life. We're running after money. Um, we, we have some money, but we're never happy. We're running after more. And finally, our life is over. We have a lot of money in a bank account, but our life is over. Our bodies are useless. We can't even enjoy it at the end of our life. We, we take our, our retirement and we have all this money, but it's the end of our life. And... A life has just been spent running after money. <clears throat> Third, a devotee controls their mind and senses. Um, so this is a very Herculean task to control our mind. We know our mind is like a, a horse. Uh, our senses are like horses running in all directions. Five horses carrying the mind in all directions. Um, so we need to control our mind how by chanting hearing the, the transcendental vibration of the holy name reading the scriptures so we can feed our intellect so we know what is right for us and what's wrong 
by hearing, engaging all our senses in the nine processes of devotional service, which is Shravanam, Kirtanam, uh, Smaranam, Padasevanam, Archanam, Vandanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atma, Nivedanam. So hearing, chanting about the holy names, qualities, forms, transcendental pastimes, smaranam, remembering the Lord at all times, padasavanam, serving the lotus feet of the Lord, uh, archanam, worshipping the Lord in his archavigraha, deity form, vandanam, offering prayers to the Lord, dasyam, like Hanuman, becoming servants, the servants of the Lord, Sakyam, considering the Lord to be the best friend, and Atmanivedinam, um, like Bali Maharaj, complete surrender. In this way, we can control our mind and senses. We know that our mind can be our best friend or our worst enemy. So our mind will, we should not let our mind take control of us because our mind is unreliable. It will only want to do things that brings uh, our senses some happiness, some pleasure. So we need to take control, take the reins of our mind and dictate to our mind what to do, what is good for us and what is bad, rather than being a slave of our mind and senses. Um, we should take control of our mind. Um, the way we do it is by, as I said, strengthening our mind, um, feeding our intellect with knowledge. So, let's see, um, that's the um, last slide. Um, it continues about why a Krishna conscious devotee attains peace from material miseries. The devotee is enlightened by knowledge of Krishna and they know they are the soul and not the body. Hence, a devotee is undisturbed in happiness, distress, honor and dishonor. So that's the instructions of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, where he says we should not be disturbed by all of these honor and dishonor, because all of these pertain to the body. And if we understand that this is temporary, and what is the value of all of this? Because we are the soul, we're not the body. And all of these things, honor, for instance, will not make us happy it's not going to give us true happiness um so if somebody says bad things about us so it's not the end of the world it's okay we're not the body we're the soul we're detached from all of this um so a devotee therefore is peaceful um is not really disturbed by all of this a devotee is free from six from the six enemies lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, and envy, and also a devotee is fearless. So all these these are gateways to hell. Lust, so if somebody is has got lust, an incredible desire to enjoy the senses, um, then how can that person attain peace? There's bound to be miseries coming um, because of that. Anger, um, we've all experienced that. Greed, illusion, where we think we're the enjoyer. Pride, madness, envy, all those things. They prevent us from attaining peace. Prahlad Maharaj was fearless. We know that we can't be peaceful if we're, we're in anxiety, we're afraid. So a devotee is not afraid because a devotee he knows that he's in good hands. Krishna is protecting them. Krishna is going to be there for them at all times. A devotee has also no enemy and forgives others because a devotee understands that um, we are all under the, we're like puppets um, being manipulated by material nature. Sometimes we're in the mode of goodness and so we have qualities like calmness, compassion. Sometimes it's passion that governs Oh, it can be a mixture of goodness and passion, passionate ignorance. There's mixtures. So um, we're like puppets in the hands of Maya. And whatever a person may say to us, as we said, we're not attached to honor, dishonor. So a devotee forgives others. A devotee does not keep resentment in their hearts. So the devotee is at peace. A devotee is happy. 
Um, even fear personified is scared of Krishna. We know um, um, Prahlad Maharaj, he was not afraid. He was at peace. His father, Hiranyakashipu, was trying so many ways to kill him. Um, but he, he, was, he was undisturbed. He was not afraid. Um, okay, um, a devotee has no enemy because a devotee sees Krishna in everyone. A devotee knows that each and every living entity is part and parcel of Krishna. The, the Jeev Atma is part and parcel of Krishna. And a devotee sees um, with equal vision uh, an elephant, a cow, a dog, a dog eater. So we know that verse um, 5.18 in the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna says, um, um, what's that verse now? Where he says, Vidya Vinaya Sampane Brahmane Kavihastini Shunicha Vashwa Pakecha Panditaha Samadarshinaha. So the humble sages, by virtue of true knowledge, see with equal vision. A cow, an elephant, a dog, and a dog eater. Alright, so now I'm going to go to the last point. Devotees have good association with other devotees who develop all good qualities of the demigods. A man is known by his company. and We should be very careful who we choose to associate with because we become influenced by that person's consciousness, his um, behavior, personality, and even unknowingly we start to copy their habits, the mentality, their consciousness, it all rubs off on, on, on us. So we have to be careful. We may think we're strong enough and uh, that maybe we are going to teach them a, a good thing or two, but actually if we're not strong in our sadhana, we're not mm, very mature in Krishna consciousness, um, their habits may rub off on us and, and they can be giving us association. Um, so here's a story of the parrot to illustrate that. So there was a person, right, who had two parrots, they like twins. Um, at some point he couldn't feed them, he couldn't um, take care of them. So he had to give them away. Um, they were very nice parrots, right? Um, so he gave he couldn't give them both to one person. He gave one to a saintly person, a Brahmin who was engaged in devotional activities, and he gave one to a butcher. Um, so the two of them, right, took care of the parrots. So after a while, <coughs> the original owner of the parrots wanted to go and visit the parrots to see how they were faring. So he went to the butcher's shop and the parrot was there sitting on the perch. When the parrot saw that person coming in through the door, he started to shout, kill him, kill him. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the person was totally astounded. He was, <laughs> he was really shocked to hear this. So he left. And he went to the Brahmin's house, and in the Brahmin's house, the parrot was very nice. Um, he was chanting the holy name. He welcomed um, this person. Um, he said, "Welcome, welcome. Please come in. Take a seat. How can I serve you?" And he's chanting the holy name. So this, so you can see how the environment can influence a consciousness so the butcher obviously he kills animals he's in the mode of ignorance um, so the parrot imbued that consciousness and the saintly person he was engaged in serving the Lord so the parrot was situated in the mode of goodness and um, yes had all good, good um, qualities so it's a, it's a very powerful story. Um, it should serve as a, as a lesson to us. Um, so devotees attain peace because they interact with 
other devotees who are like-minded, who have developed good qualities through their practice of Krishna consciousness over the years, so, um, compassion, peacefulness, um, tolerance, um, kindness, um, yes, all of this, an absence of false pride. So, so yes, yeah, so that was just a, a glimpse of the verse. I hope this has helped, um, helped you to understand what this verse is about. It's, it's so much can be said, but this is just a little glimpse. So, let us all chant Hare Krishna and attain peace from material miseries. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. If you have liked the video, please don't forget to put a like and subscribe to the channel for more discussions. Thank you.